Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. I'm Sandra Reyes. I am a, an assistant for the online training at La CNIC, and today I'm starting this webinar. Let me start by thanking you all for coming. And today we'll discuss two topics. The first part will be the tutorial on the administration of the Milagnic resources by Lorenzo Avelenda, resource analyst of LACNIC. And the second part will be the proposal for policies in LACNIC 35 by Mariela Rocha, the coordinator of policies and training of LACNIC. And uh, Thomas Lynch and Ariel Ware will, are the current uh, moderators for the PT of LACNIC. So before I give them the floor, let me tell you briefly how the webinar will uh, take place for those of you who are coming for the first time. So let me share the presentation. So we started at exactly 17 UTC. This webinar will last about uh, two hours. The first 60 minutes will be the tutorial on uh, the uh, resources uh, administration. And the second is the proposal for uh, policies for LACNIC uh, 35. In the two cases, you will be able to uh, interact with the panelists in the Q&A um, app. You see the, the bubbles there in the um, toolbar. And um, please uh, be so kind as to write all your comments and your remarks uh, and doubts. Uh, and we'll leave some time at the end of each presentation to answer all the questions in by order of occurrence. Let me remind you too that this webinar will be recorded and in um, for coming days, you'll receive the video of the recording the year uh, you're going to receive it at uh, the email address that you registered with and finally for any comments or questions that you may have please write to our um, email address training at lacnic.net and you can also visit lacnic's website so now let me give the floor to lorenzo hello lorenzo please go ahead hello sandra thank you for the introduction let me start with a presentation on uh, the resource administration. I'm going to share the presentation. Can you please tell me if you can see the screen? Yes, we see it very well. Good. So let me introduce myself. I'm Lorenzo Avelenda, and I work in uh, the service uh, area as an analyst of internet resources. And usually I process requests of IP resources and transfers. And the aim of this presentation was uh, to somehow explain the way Milagnik functions and how you can use, how, how it can be used by new members or by older members. You can all use the platform to administer the resources assigned by Lacnic. So thank you all for joining us today in this meeting. And I'm going to start. In this tutorial, we're going to see the services offered by Mila Knick going, and uh, we are going to see more in depth uh, the how the system of requests works. For those of you who have been with us for a longer time, it's not something that was always in Mila Knick. We introduced it last year. Um, uh, the request uh, system uh, uh, was included in Milagnik, so requesting and administering the resources would be easier and more accessible. So let me start by explaining how a new member can request IPv4 and how you enter requests for IPv6 and ASN that are available for all members. In addition, for those of you who are already registered in Milagnik, I'm going to explain, you, to explain to you how you can update the contacts of your administration to uh, keep contact with the LACNIC. And also, um, we'll make sure that the published uh, information is updated. Then we're going to go to the technical part of Milagnik. First, I'm going to explain how to sub-allocate resources and then how 
to delegate the RNS for the IPs assigned by LACNIC or a provider. So the next thing that we're going to present is the API for registration in the LACNIC. This, this has been operating for several years. I'm going to explain what it's all about and the benefits it has on the interface that we all know of Mila Knick. And the last two items are RPKI, that's a certification system. I'm going to explain how it works and what it is for. And finally, a functionality of a feature of Mila Knick that is a report of state such as RPKI or RDNS. I'm going to explain what they can be used for and how you can access those reports. So let's start. The first thing that we need to know is that Milaknik is um, at the URL milaknik.laknik.net. When you enter, you can see that uh, uh, screen that's uh, opening the session, the start session. We're going to explain how the interface works in a minute. The objective of Milaknik is consists of several things. It's a portal for the administration of IP resources and the ASNs assigned uh, by LACNIC. It also, it also has an online payment system to pay the initial request and also for renewal of annual membership. The online payment can be through credit card or paper, PayPal, and it's all done through Milacnic. It also enables you to keep the database updated. Once you register, you have to enter with an email address and to enter contact information. This information is public so that the people that use the internet may have a contact of the company that, is, that has been assigned to the resources. And it is important for that information to be updated so that any users with any questions about the use of IPs may contact the company directly. Another thing that LACNIC um, includes is uh, registering for the events as LACNIC uh, 35. You could do it through me LACNIC and uh, the virtual trainings are uh, free of charge for all members and they are also available in me LACNIC. So as I said, the URL is milaknik.laknik.net and you can access it through mobile phones or through browsers. Let me explain how you use the platform. To enter, you need to have a Milaknik user. The Laknik users are an identifier and uh, it's one for each user. My identifier, for instance, is L O. A10. And there are also three letter ident uh, identifiers. And in the tutorial, we are going to see, for instance, how these identifiers work to show how each user will see Melaknik. So bear in mind that you need a user ID in Melaknik. If you haven't registered yet, you may create a user um, in Milagnik. You need uh, an email address, a telephone, and the postal um, address. And after, after that, you click on a crear una nueva cuenta, create a new, create a new account. And after you confirm your email address, then uh, an identifier is created for you and you can enter. Let's assume that you've already created your user and you're entering for the first time. At the beginning, Mila Knick presents this interface. It has a lateral bar with a contextual menu that offers most functionalities such as navigation. In the middle, we have a dashboard with recent information with uh, member news, and uh, tweets of the LACNIC account. And for um, users with resources, you're going to have uh, more information on resources as they are added. 
so far. It's a platform that enables you to enter the request and to be updated, to be up to date with what's happening. Not a minor issue is that to the right on top, there are some icons. The most useful so far is the one with an A, that is to change the language. Milaknik is available in Spanish, Portuguese, and English. And after you change it, whenever you come in, you will be shown the interface and all the contents in the language that you previously requested. Then you have the bell with notifications that's going to be of use when there are any news or when there are events that are notified to the user. So the contextual menu, you have uh, a drop down menu and you can access through the contact information that you entered at the beginning. You can update it. You can also add a new uh, post address and define it a, a mail, an email as a secondary email in case you need to send a, a recovery code. And, and then you have a page that is for payment of uh, the uh, bills uh, therefore for the initial payment of the request very useful and finally non-member organized or, or again, other non-member organizations you have new organizations and those that are not members of LACNIC but that as a contact they have the um, user that accessed in the case of the um, uh, one of those examples can be, for example, if an internet uh, service provider assigns IP addresses to our company, for instance, and we, with our users, we enter Mila Knik, and in this menu, we can see both the organization and the IPs that were assigned by this provider. It's important to distinguish the IPs appointed by LACNIC that are going to appear in a separate menu when the user has resources and the IPs of the provider that are going to be appear in the menu of other organizations. Now many of the functionalities are offered to those IPs at me LACNIC even though they haven't been assigned by LACNIC. So you can enter that menu and check the available options. It is also important to note that in this same menu is where you start the request for resources. I will stop here to tell you that if you have any questions, please, write them in the Q&A box of the Zoom platform. And at the end of the presentation, we'll be answering these online. So let me go on now. In terms of non-member organizations, this is what the users see when they access the first time. You can create a new organization at Milaknik. This consists in entering the name of the organization, the address, telephone number, and website, for example. And with that information, you already have an ID for the organization. And in that way, you will be on in the process for requesting resources. You can also create an organization so that your provider can assign resources to you. Once you created the organization, the list at the bottom shows a test organization. So you see the organization as the identifier, the contact details, the user that is the administrator. And right on the right, um, option, the options, you have three buttons. The first one is request IP or ASN. If you click there, we go over to the next screen. And for this organization, there are two options. You can request IPv4. This 
implies requesting IPv6 by all means, because according to the policies, you have to request these simultaneously. And in that same request, you can also ask for an ASN. Just to clarify, as from last year, LACNIC exhausted its pool of addresses that had never been assigned and is now assigning IPv4 based on those addresses that are released from the quarantine of returned or revoked addresses from other organizations. This means that there is a waiting list of organizations that are queuing up to receive an IPv4 assignment. At this stage, if an organization requests resources, it should first fill in the IPv6 analysis and then receive IPv6 and ASN. Once the IPv6 is received, IPv4 was requested automatically, and then they enter this waiting list. Once, when the time comes for assigning an IPv4 to that organization, then we analyze whether all the requirements are met to receive IPv4. The other alternative is not requesting IPv4 and asking IPv6 or an ASN filling in the request that is further down at the bottom. I will now show you what Milak Nick looks like once the organization has become a member. The appearance changes in terms of the context menu on the left side. As you can also note, the green bell has three notifications. Probably these are events. This is typical for all the members. Once you become a member organization, you have access to all the training activities at LACNIC as well as all the events free of cost. I will now speak more about this new menu that we see on the left. In that menu, we first have an option, which is information. This was not there previously. Here, you can edit your profile, but for the purpose of the organization that is there. If you see UI, PPL organization, that's the identifier of the organization below that. Under that item, you can edit all the contact information for that organization, postal address, telephone number and contact. All member organizations have three contacts. One is an administration contact, which has the capacity to edit all the other contacts and to manage the IPs and to request transfers as well as additional resources. Then we have the contact for invoicing, which receives the renewal invoice every year. And finally, the membership contact, which is the one that receives all the invitations to events, which I mentioned earlier on. The next item in the menu is IP slash ASN resources. Here, you can do IP the sub-assignments, those that are assigned to the organizations. You can delegate the IGNSs for the IPs. You can request additional resources, for example, IPv6 or an additional ASN, and then also carry out transfers or returns of resources in the event of considering that you wish to transfer or return part of the resources that had been assigned. The next item in the menu is services. These services include the RPKI portal. We're going to speak more about that in a while. Then we have IRR, which is a way of creating objects, which are then published in the Milaknik IRR. 
the advantage of creating creating these objects is that they somehow show how the resources are being used. And this information is then published so that it can be viewed by other organizations. So this can be coordinated with other providers to announce that these resources are being used in a specific type of way. For example, the announcements that are made or the ASNs that belong to the same group. So that information is public. Then we have the geo feeds. This is a tool that enables geolocation of the IPs. The users enter and indicate where the IPs assigned to it are being used. For example, I have an organization in Montevideo, Uruguay, that is a postal address of the organization, but I have a branch in a smaller locality. So I sub assign the IPs to that branch. And in GeoFeeds, I enter the smallest block, for example, a slash 29. And that slash 29, I indicate that is the used in that locality. This is for the purpose of clarifying things, no matter if the organization is in Montevideo, the resources can be used in a different locality. And then the list of transfers. The list of transfers is a list of organizations that offer or receive resources, which basically wish to exchange information in order to apply for or receive resources from other organizations that are interested in doing so. There are also brokers, which are businesses that assist the, to, to complete a transfer. You can, you have to enter your request your application and then complete the process. Then you have a membership module here. You can view all the invitations received by the organization. This also allows you to have access to the online training activities. And in the case of elections for the board, the voting option is enabled through Milaknik in that module. In, as regards payments, we saw this earlier on. This has an additional functionality, namely that when the user becomes a member, this shows all the previous payments that were completed and when the renewal date is due. Finally, there is right at the bottom, the, you have the option on reports. I will explain this in greater detail later on, but basically this includes an RPKI status. In other words, those announcements that I'm making at present, which are certified with RPKI and which are the ones that have a, a, a wrong RPKI and which are not certified the same for the RDNS which have been delegated, which have not been delegated, and which are incorrect. Then the status of the requests, and if the applicant entered a request for a transfer from the transfer list or requests for IPs, you can check the status of the requests there. And finally, there is an item on security. This is a report based on what the CSERT of LACNIC publishes, namely, this is a summary based on all the ERPs that have been assigned by the organization. This report shows if those IPs were involved in some security incident. And if that is the case, it shows which was that incident and any action that might be required. Obviously, this is a summary. The correct thing would be for this to show the IPs that have been uh, in, in, 
involved and these are connected with a C cert. Now let's go back to the main menu. Under information, you can edit the information of that organization. And at the bottom, you have the contact information. In order to edit the contact information, first you have to click on this button and then you see the three contacts administration invoicing and membership at the bottom you have a box where you can look up a user it is important to highlight that the users have to have been created you cannot create a user on this screen so if the user we wish to include as a is a person we want to include in a contact uh, we first have to exit create a new user in the main screen before you can add that person here. Once we created the user, we enter the ID or the email address or the name and surname. In my case, I remember my ID, so I include LOA10 and I put search, click on search, buscar. Electnik shows me all the users that have been registered with that information and if you look here there is an options menu with three different buttons admin membership and invoicing these three are the options that we have here to replace the current users with one of the ones that i found so for example if i click on admin automatically milaknik shows me a pre-visualization of how what this would look like if I were to change the previous user and replace it with mine. This is just for the purpose of before saving these changes. So you can check different possibilities. I could include myself as well as a membership contact. And once we are happy with the changes, then we click on save. And this then completes the editing of the contacts. The second menu, which is a slash ASN, when I click here, this deploys three different options. Request, which is for requesting new resources like IPv4 or ASN. And then the option of managing or administering. This is one we're interested in right now. Here you see that uh, there's a drop down menu and uh, it summarizes all the resources assigned, uh, not only the LACNIC IPs, but also the ASN. And uh, if there were any other the providers, that you would have it in a box that is uh, the IPs of the sub assigned. It's important for the rest of this part. We are just going to be editing the information of the block or the ASN that we select. So it's very important first to look at the listing and then to start editing what's more to the right. So for instance, if you look at this uh, in the upper part, it tells me that uh, the IP is uh, uh, um, that is allocated so as not to make any changes in IPv6 so no, actually we want to administer IPv4. Now to sub allocate resources we select the block and we uh, write sub allocate and the important thing here it's well first of all it's part of the policy that all the slash 29 or greater more than eight IPs must be registered in LACNIC's uh, database if they are being used by other organizations or customers or, for instance, uh, an organization that collaborates with um, uh, LACNIC members. So it's important to record all these uh, uh, larger um, uh, allocations so as to record which are the companies that are using the resources. Once we look at uh, sub, sub allocate, we see two options to the left. There may be uh, 
an organization that uh, was already created and to the right, you can create a new organization for suballocation. Let's assume that we already have the organization created. You fill in the information, you put search and you'll see all the organizations with that name. Here we have two. So I see that the one that I wanted is the one that starts with UY, that's Uruguay. And I click on the blue arrow and that takes me takes me to a second um, uh, tab. Here I have the parent block that is selected and uh, the organization that I want to suballocate it to. Now what's missing is, let's see the next one. In, in this parent block that I just selected, I have to choose the IP and especially the prefix, which will be the rank of uh, IPs and when I have it, I put add and it adds to the prefixes that will be suballocated and uh, I do next uh, and then I'll be able to preview the change. The parent uh, IP block would be the slash 22 and the organization of destination would receive a slash 24. So, and I put suballocate, confirm, sorry. And after that, the block has been suballocated to the uh, uh, organization. The other function that I wanted to show you is the possibility of delegating RNS. Um, a, um, so I, we ensure that the IP is correct. There on top, you see the IP. And then we select um here so here the block is 179.0.156/22 everything is free so i can uh, choose to delegate it and if i am going to delegate it uh, it takes me to this part so the uh, rdns uh, delegation can be used for several things for instance anti-spam filters that check that uh, the server that from which you received uh, the communication may belong to the IP that uh, they claim to belong to. So it's important if we if you need it to uh, you should know that you can do it from Melaknik. So once we are here, we select we automatically we complicate a slash twenty two. However. The delegation of uh, the Ernest can be done uh, down to a slash 24. And we select uh, the RDNS the block that we want uh, to delegate and we do it. So when we add the block under at the bottom, you see that you can put up to six servers. They're going to be in charge of the reverse resolution. It's important to remember two things that you may delegate more than one IP block for the same server, the same by putting add, but please consider that all the servers need to respond authoritatively to the IPs they're delegating them to. So that's going to be che checked later on, but please consider that before registering this, you have to configure the DNS server for all of those addresses. Another thing that you need to consider is that uh, both uh, LACNIC um, assigned IPs or, uh, or, or provider um, IPs can be delegated, but you can't delegate a smaller block if the parent block is, has already been delegated. So first you need to check that the provider has not delegated his block before. If there's no reverse uh, delegation, then you can do it with a subassigned IPs. So an important thing is that when you complete the service, you need to use the MDQN uh, uh, format. You can't you can't, can't use an AKA. Uh, uh, that uh, may respond to another name. It needs to be the server, the address of the server in the F Q 
to the end format. Once you have the delegation, we select the block and the server. Technic goes to the server, asks for the reverses of those IPs, and as you see there, it says that it responds authoritatively to this IP and these addresses, so we would be ready to confirm it. That would be the next step. So it would be the slash 22 would de be delegated as a primary DNS, DNS2, and as an alternative um, uh, DNS1. Um, so we put here finish or uh, the next and so so that would be all that allegation is ready the next thing that i wanted to mention is the api uh, of uh, registration in melechnik application programming interface that's what api means um, it's uh, to communicate to informatic uh, uh, to iet systems if you want to communicate for instance with melechnik the registry base through an API, there's no need for you to, to know how Milaknik has been programmed, but there are there's a set of standard rules that are preset and you can query on the database, for instance, writing information to Milaknik without even knowing how it's implemented. The API of registration in Milaknik allows the uh, LACNIC members to interact with the registry uh, um, system based on uh, scripts with a, a predefined uh, format. And they can do the same with LACNIC running programs. Running, and that makes it possible to automate the entry of information. The API has been thought for associates that uh, administer large amounts of space so that they can implement the best uh, management policies, infrastructure, and access to information. Some of the advantages of using the API is that it increases the productivity of uh, the operations team because it, as you can automate uh, several tasks, you need fewer people entering Milaknik to process the information. And also, as it's a script, it's less likely uh, to make mistakes. Uh, mistakes are not so frequent, and it also gives you a better control of the change processes. If you automate a script to run, probably you'll know when you will be modifying the database and so it's a more predictable behavior what can milaknik do to your right you see the interface um the swagger that it's a uh, where uh, uh Laknik has it uh, for users to use it's not in uh, Mila, in like milaknik it's a, a separate web but the idea is to have a great graphic interface so that more users can implement it, but it also works if you connect, you can use it from a command terminal and do the same as in Milaknik, but through codes, making it possible to automate several functionalities that are typically mm, done through Milaknik. Services include the management of organizations, obtaining information of users, for instance, asking for an email, and then they, they will uh, give you the ID of the user, then management of a sun assignment and obtaining information on an IP block, uh, the reverse DNS delegations management, and the management of ASNs. To access the API, you need to re request access first. The requirement is you need to have the intent to use it. To request access, you have to send an email to hostmaster at lacnic.net, sending the org ID of a 
the, the identity of the organization, we always uh, tell uh, the organization to have resources to use, not because it's a requirement, but because the experience with the API is mostly focused to the administration of resources. So if the, ad, if the organization doesn't have any, then the uh, functionalities are very limited. But you, you can enable uh, test uh, organization, but if you have resources, then you can make the most uh, of uh, those features in practice. In addition to the org ID, you need to send us the name, the contact name, the uh, uh, contact email addresses, and the PGP key. The, the PGP key enables you to encrypt the mail that we receive so we can send the authentication uh, credentials uh, in code encoded so that only the um, um, addressee will re be able to read it. You can uh, enter the demo that's available on the website there, HTTPS slash, well, there you have it. You can open the website and see the functionalities and anyway you need a user to be able to you to use those functions so on rpki i wanted to explain that the certification of uh, resources through rpkis is a way to digitally uh, demonstrate uh, that uh, the user has the right to use IPv4 and IPv6 addresses through a cryptographic material. In addition, Milechnik offers the possibility of creating these, these cryptographic uh, certificates automatically based uh, on uh, the assigned resources that the organization already has. So entering the contextual menu by services, you you'll see a drop down uh, menu then in the rpki uh, if, if this is the first time that you enter they're going to ask you whether you want to create those cryptographic uh, certificates so just using the assigned ips they know how to use the certificate so once the certificate has been created you have the option of creating RO, ROAs, ROAs. ROAs are objects that allow you to certify the announcement of IPs in the internet. How is this done? Well, simply you base yourself on the information that Milaknik has and that the organization has the administration of these IP addresses. Then the user when making this announcement through a given ASN, for example, the ASN of your provider, enters this in the form and in the space down there, the IPs are entered, which are going to be used by the ASNs. This compares the announcements you have in the internet, namely all the ASNs that are currently announcing blocks these are compared with the ones that the user that has the resource administration has registered. Now it might happen that a given announcement might not have a corresponding one in RPKAI. In that case, nothing is done. But it might happen that the user creates the corresponding ROA for that announcement RPKI certifies this, and the late last case is the an allowed announcement is detected by the RPKI as one that is not valid. So this is then invalidated because it doesn't have a valid certificate, uh, doesn't have an valid ROA. And this is important, for example, to prevent route hijacking where an ASN states that they have the authority to announce certain resources when in fact it does not have the authority to make that announcement. So in that case, 
if the administrator of those IPs created an ROA, then no one else other than the person who created the ROA has the capacity of announcing those IPs. That's the advantage of having RPKI. Namely, once you have an, certified all your announcements, whoever else announces your blocks will receive, receive an invalid announcement, which is then rejected by the majority of the major carriers. So route hijacking becomes more difficult. In addition to this, once you created the RPKIs, you check you can check the status of the announcements that I was mentioning a while ago. You go to reports and the RPKI status. Once you get here, you can see that from all the IPv4 and IPv6 announcements, which are those that have been validated by RPKI, which have not been validated or had not been validated. These are the ones that are not found and which are invalid. So this is an announcement, announcement that is made in the internet, but there is an ROA information stating that these could be incorrect. Further down, 16% of all the announcements of this organization are invalid. So in order to check which are those that have an error, we have a table that shows, for example, ASN 2784843 is announcing blocks of the organization. However, there is no ROA that certifies this. So Milaknik informs us, and if we see that that ASN is known to us, and we want to make that announcement, then we correct it and fix it. But if this were to be an announcement that we don't recognize, in that case, we'd have to contact the owner of that ASN to inform that person that the resources are being assigned, that we have been assigned. And finally, in the same way as we can check the RPKI status, we can also check the RDNS status with, that we configured earlier on. This in order to verify whether these are correct or incorrect. The RDNS is, in order to register these, they have to be correct in principle, but if there were to be a problem with the server, over time, these could become incorrect. We see that 43 of all IP blocks have been delegated, and this has been done correctly. 56% has not been delegated. In other words, they have no server configured. So these can continue to be used, but they don't have reverse resolution to one that has been configured. So that would be all regarding the Milaknik tutorial. We can now go and answer the questions, if any. Sandra, let me know. Lorenzo, thank you very much for your presentation. Yes, we will go over to the questions. Those of you who haven't asked any questions to do so in the Q&A box. Feel free to do so, any question or comment are to be included in the Q&A box. Lorenzo. Let's go to the first question. The question is asked by Vladimir Roca, and he would like to know how can I assign the IP address of the provider? I think that what he is referring to is a sub-assignment part. In fact, it is a provider that, when entering Milaknik, can assign to their organization those IPs that they are using. For example, so that Vladimir can use the IPs at Milaknik, he has to ask the provider to enter Milaknik and sub-assign these to him 
as I explained the tutorial, so that these IPs are addressed are assigned to his company. There is a second question also by Vladimir Roca, and he'd like to know if we can have a personalized assistance for the proper implementation and configuration of the platform. Yes, of course. I would say that if you have any specific questions to please write to hostmaster at lacnic.net. And in that case, we can organize answer by email. We can answer your queries by email regarding configuration of that platform. There's no problem there. So, a comment regarding the first question. With what user would the provider enter? If that provider is a LACNIC member, they can have a LACNIC user. All our members have an administration user. So the provider is likely to know that person. And I'd simply like to ask him to enter BLACNIC and register the address block that the company is using. So I think he will be contacting you at the hostmaster address. So far, we have no more questions. Well, we have one more question from Vladimir. We're going to read that. I have two blocks that have been assigned. How can I remove these? In that case, in the same way in which you can register these, I will show you in my presentation. Here, this is done by the provider in the section on sub-assignments. So the provider can see uh, all the sub-assignments that have been made and can eliminate those that are not up to date. So if you have an IP that has been assigned to your company, you contact your provider and ask that provider to eliminate it through Milacnic. And well, if this doesn't correspond to our provider, that's a question. Well, the IP that has been assigned to you, you should nevertheless contact the provider that has sub-assigned this to you. This information is in LACNIC's pool and during the is in the IP that has been assigned to you, you can check who this corresponds to and whom you have to contact in order to eliminate it. We have another question from Leonel Roman. He's asking to assign a block that was assigned to us by LACNIC. Can we use the ASN of our provider, which is UFINET? I think he is referring to announcing. Yes, that's correct. But, uh, yeah. To announce the blocks, you don't need to have your own ASN. You can use the ASN of your provider in order to announce the blocks that have been assigned to you by LACNIC. We have another question, but this was included in the chat by Ariel. He would like to, if it's mandatory to complete the RPKI and IRR data. No, it's not mandatory. This is by default, the status of all the blocks is not found unless one were to answer at least one ROA certifying announcement, an announcement. The advantage is that a provider that sees that this has been certified, the trust will be greater on what is being announced. If this was not created, many providers won't deny this access, but it is likely that in the future, once The RPKI, if it has a lot of penetration, it might be necessary to certify all the announcements in order to be able to do so, to announce them. We have a final question from someone who has identified themselves. 
is it possible to lease blocks, IP4 blocks to Arin and use this with our LACNIC ASN? Yes, it is possible, but it is necessary that the ARIN provider is willing to announce them through his ASN. As a rule to request an ASN, you have to have addresses that will be used in the region. So if you have an ARIN block, it is a bit difficult to justify that these will be used in the region. But if you send your application, the person who asked the question, well, this will be analyzed to see whether you can receive these resources from a different region, from the Aryan region, in the case of your question. Thank you, Lorenzo. We have no more questions from the participants. So we will go on to the second part. We thank you very much for your presentation and participation. And we now give the floor to the second part of the webinar. If you have any questions, remember you can write to the address hostmaster at lacnic.net regarding issues of this first part of the seminar. Now we'll go over to the second part of the seminar. We give the floor to Mariela Rocha, who will be speaking about the policy proposals of LACNIC 35. She'll be with Ariel Weher and Thomas Lynch, who are the moderators of the FPP of LACNIC. Hello, can you hear me? Thank you, Sandra, for the introduction. We will be working with Ariel. We hope that Thomas will join us. He had a complicated agenda today, but he will be will be here with you. Okay, we are here nevertheless. Hi, good afternoon. Yes, thank you for joining us. So as uh, the coordinator of policies and uh, training, that's me and uh, Ariel and uh, Thomas. Well, uh, you elected uh, me to, to help in this role that is so important in uh, the LACNIC community, that is to moderate not just uh, the list and the execution of the policies, but also the forum. So, uh, Ariel and Thomas are the ones that uh, encourage uh, the discussion, uh, they make com uh, comments, they give their feedback, they organize the agendas, but especially they moderate the discussions. So, this we put this presentation together with Ariel. Ariel did most of the things, I only made a couple of changes. So he's uh, the uh, author. Yes, we are going to do our best to try to have a good public uh, uh, policy form um, as uh, dynamic as possible. We invite you all to participate and to ask as many questions as you deem necessary. Remember that we are all here to help you and to try to answer all your questions. And the key objective that we have is First of all, is to promote, to encourage participation in the process of policy development, because in the end, the community of the internet, not necessarily just uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, all the community all over the world may define uh, the processes of the policies. And in our case, then LACNIC will um, make use of them. So it's very important. Sometimes the word policy uh, frightens people but you will see that it's absolutely not complicated. And all of us, from our points of view and uh, from our personal point of view, we can participate and we can uh, contribute for the development of the whole thing. Well, that was a very good uh, uh, start because the first slide that we have, it's a slide that we believe is the most important is 
we, we are starting with what could be the end, but it's actually the beginning. That's a participation to participate. Yeah. So do you need to have a special role in the process? No, absolutely not. Anybody can participate in this policy process. Um, uh, you don't need to be affiliated to any associations. You don't need to work for any company related with connectivity or with the delivery of internet services. Anybody that may just have an email address and willing to participate can do that. So this space that LACNIC provides us is especially open to people from outside the region to, as a matter of fact, you'll see that if you join the policy list that there are participants from other regions, such as Europe or Africa. As a matter of fact, yeah, so it's open for everybody. Well, let me, let me add, and I'm going to re reinforce what Ariel said, anybody can participate, but please consider that if in addition we belong to an, uh, an organization that is a LACNIC member, whatever is decided through the public, uh, through the policy process, that is what rules the policy manual as to how the registry needs to administer the resources in the region. If in addition, we belong to a member organization. It's even more important for us to participate in the decisions in, a, in the development of the policies because we are all together defining how LACNIC is going to administer the resources. So LACNIC is the registry and uh, it's good uh, for you all to participate. It's very important that if I'm a member, there's an additional a plus of interest to participate. And another thing that I wanted to add to what you said, and it is that it's important to have all the stakeholders because the policy development process is um, was designed or is implemented in such a way that all the stakeholders to be represented. They're all represented, civil society, the academia, the industry, the technical community, everybody on an equal basis. So it's very important to have representation of all the parties. So when uh, you ask, um, can anybody participate? Do you need to be a part of the technical community? No, everybody can participate. So let's tell you what the life cycle of a proposal is since an actor or an author or a group of authors decide to create it. For instance, I may have a proposal for Melachnik's uh, policy manual uh, in the part that discusses the resources, or I have a proposal to modify the same process through which LACNIC permits a proposal to be implemented, that is the PDP. So I, with the proposals, I can modify either the policy manual that tells me, that uh, gives the rules of procedure uh, for the administration of the resources of LACNIC or a process whereby this happens. I can add a couple of things. If you participated maybe a long time ago at some event of LACNIC uh, in person, or if you were there at a policy forum, that's a very special time of each uh, event of LACNIC, especially if you saw this a long time ago, this is not the same. What, uh, Mariela is presenting here is the policy development process that was implemented starting in 2018, if I'm not wrong. So it might be that because the same, the community itself said that the system that was being used had to be changed, it had to be readapted. So the community, by making proposals in a way, redefined the process for developing each uh, policy. So if some of you participated in a forum a long time ago, you'll see that this is not the same thing you may remember. So this is a process that was developed quite recently, three years ago. 
there was a lot of discussion, but we, it was ratified and implemented. If I'm not wrong, we, I think we launched it in Rosario, October 2018 or 2017, I don't remember. So you may have found this at the event and it's very interesting to see what the current process is. It's this timeline that you have here. On the other hand, I have my doubts that if any of you was ever involved in the administration of resources, either, uh, for, for instance, if you had to request resources for your organization, an IP block, an ASN, I have my doubts I, that you may, you may all have uh, asked yourself, why am I asked all this? Why? Uh, well, precisely, that's the reason why we ask you to participate in the uh, policy uh, development process, because that results directly from, the, uh, from that process and the things that we include into the manual or remove from the manual. So if you ever saw yourself in the situation where you said, well, I have to uh, give all this information, but I think that could be, this could be more efficient. There, clearly, you have an opportunity to submit a proposal so that all the community may assess whether something can be improved. So, basically, this is the model of the process that needs to be done so that everybody gets uh, ratified and is finally included in the manual. Well, the first stage that any proposal has to meet. A proposal first is uh, created in the mind of one or more authors. They decide that this proposal should be debated in the in LACNIC's uh, policy forum. So they enter the uh, web, they fill in the form, and they complete Completed, and then the proposal starts its cycle. The proposal is born. Initially, it's a proposal and it will be a policy if it's implemented. The proposal is created. The first stage is the initial discussion. So the proposal that was created will be in the mailing list uh, for eight weeks. It's, it's a mailing list where all those interested in debating this are subscribed. We have about 1,000 people in that mailing list. And then for eight weeks, the proposal is there for debate and the people discuss about it. Uh, they give their feedback, they debate it. And after eight weeks, then the, the, the first stage is not completed. You need something. In addition to those eight weeks, the proposal needs to be uh, presented at the public policy forum. This is a meeting where we discuss the proposal, we continue the discussion, but it would be sort of discussing it live, either in person or online. But it's a sort of, it's like a meeting where we debate, um, the proposals on the proposals. Uh, uh, Marie, let's see, I have an idea. How can I uh, create it? How can I develop it? Can somebody help me? I don't know anything about policies. I have an idea and I think it, it would be a good thing for it to be implemented. Who can help me? How can I send it? Do I send a fax? No. I don't know whether the facts will get here. But what you can do is to write in the uh, a policy list, uh, mailing list, you can say, I think that we have to discuss this topic. What do you think? And then people will give you the feedback and people may say, yes, and we're forgetting this or that. So this would, um, uh, maybe they say, can you draft it? We can help you draft it. So the moderators may also help draft it so that the author, when the author, the author can complete the idea and uh, after completing the form that is sort of the last uh, step then the proposal will be created and may start going through all its stages of course you can receive help but it's also important to debate in the mailing list um, 
to debate about the importance of a proposal. That is, it's, that's very good. But somebody can see the list and write down, well, we have this or that problem. Do you think it warrants a proposal? That's very, very enriching. So, so once you get to this stage of initial discussion after the eight weeks and a public policy forum, then we have a second stage and that's what we call the first consensus. And here I let you uh, discuss it because you are the ones who know about it. So Ariel, tell us, what the what uh, does this mean, a first consensus? Because you have 14 days to complete that. Well, let me tell you, not using the whole specific jargon, you are going to propose something, you're going to fill in a form, that form will be presented, it uh, leads to a proposal in the policy system, and from there, the proposal is published. And once it's published, you debate it for eight weeks in the list and in a forum, at least one forum. For instance, if I propose uh, something in December, I submit a proposal in December. From December on, I have eight weeks, two months. So I have December, January, February, and the forum won't take place until May, that is next week. So you're going to have actually much more than eight weeks. It, it all depends on when the, you present the proposal and when the next forum is. So we are going to have at least eight weeks, sometimes it could be much more, to receive comments in the mailing list and to be able to respond to all those comments. That may lead uh, to, uh, that may convince you that uh, maybe you need a new proposal or you can move on forward and then when when you presented the proposal in the forum and it has at least eight weeks or more in uh, the mailing list it is there that you start with the consensus the moderators in the policy forum that's what we're going to have uh, next week um, uh, Wednesday and Thursday and uh, Friday, we take all the comments, uh, uh, everything in favor or against. And those comments, we take them from what is declared in the forum. That is, it's declared because somebody calls me on the phone and says, well, I think that this or that proposal, well, that is not considered. We don't consider messages and things that are written somewhere else that is not the official mailing list for the policies or in the forum. So we take all the people in favor and the support of a, a proposal and we take the, object, the existing objections against a proposal. But these have to have a basis. You cannot just say, well, I don't agree with the proposal and that's it. You really have to have a justification and also you have to defend your position stating why you are against a proposal. So no proposal will reach consensus no matter no matter how many reasons you state. So you have to have really valid arguments. So here we go, then consensus is not reached. And this is one of the things that is repeated mostly during the policy development process. We just don't vote based on a simple majority. 1,000 can be in favor of something moving forward, but if one single person says this is wrong and this is duly justified, then that single justification against it leads not to not having consensus and this stops the process. This is what we describe as determining the consensus. So in some cases and some proposals, this is very easy. And you say, well, this leads to destroying the internet and 1,000 pieces. So we see that this might have a serious outcome and people say, okay, that's clear, no matter 
if it has gone through all the stages, it goes against what the community wishes or what we're all aiming at. And consensus not reached, but there are other definitions that are quite uh, sensitive. Some things are not so easy to see. That's why we have a 14 day period, because with the other moderator, we have to evaluate all the support and all the people who spoke against to determine whether one is valid enough to stop the process or to make it go forward. So on day 14, up to day 14, we say this proposal is ready to move over to step number three or consensus is not reached and we have to start from the beginning once again. Okay, thank you for your explanation. So it's quite clear this is not about voting. Consensus is more complex than that. It has to do with objections, with support, but most of all, this has to do with expressing, stating objections clearly if you're against it. Well, and something else that I forgot to say, there has to be a discussion. So, if there's a proposal and only two people say, well, I agree, and that is it, then moderators have to see whether that proposal has an impact. It cannot be that just two people say, well, I agree, and nobody else says anything. So it's not so easy. It's quite complicated because because this is not a voting system, it requires a lot of reasoning on behalf of the moderators. As you realize, we are, are really uh, working intensively on all these things. In some cases, we say everyone agrees, but everyone might be two or three people. This doesn't mean that this was discussed in depth. So sometimes consensus ends up asking for some more time so people can state their opinion and we can really check whether the community is interested in this proposal going forward. So for example, you can decide on not granting consensus so that further time can be dedicated to discuss the policy, right? But let us assume, for example, that a proposal reaches consensus. Let us imagine that things flow and it goes to stage number three, which is for final comments. This is a four week stage, not eight like the first, right? In this stage, we expect to receive final minute comments or some clarification or some editing changes. Do you agree, Ariel? Well, this is like when you get married. Speak now or you're doomed. <laughs> um, but that is a concept that those of you who have comments, mostly for not providing support. So, yes, something is right. So then you go over to the next consensus. And when you reach the consensus and the moderators conduct a similar process compared to the first consensus, but now the process, the proposal has made progress, then they determine the second consensus. For the second time, they determine whether this can go forward. If it reaches consensus, it goes over to the final one, which is ratification slash implementation stage. And this means that the proposal was approved by the community and it goes over to the ratification stage to be done by the board of LACNIC. And once the board ratifies that proposal, The proposal then is implemented. Implementation can be quite simple, for example, a change in the manual, or it can be a bit more complex. This has to do with changes in LACNIC systems. So in that sense, we're going to make some additional comments regarding the impact 
and the Lachnic, and Lachnic system. So basically, that is a process followed by a proposal. In a simplified way, well, the author writes the proposal, the moderators verify the wording and approve this for publication. Then the mailing list becomes active, discussion begins in the mailing list. And in this case, in order to contribute to the discussion list, LACNIC very often conducts an impact analysis. I'm going to tell you what this is all about. So after eight weeks, the time comes to present this at the forum and following the eight weeks of discussion and the presentation at the forum, the moderators determine whether there was consensus or not. And then we have the other steps, of course, depending on point number five, namely whether there was consensus was reached or not. So what happens if a proposal does not reach consensus? Well, when a proposal does not reach consensus, let us assume that consensus was not reached because the community said no to it. As I was saying a while ago, there can be two issues that explain why consensus is not reached. One is because the community states that there are real objections that could not be solved by the author and could not be fixed. And someone said, well, this proposal has this problem and this problem. If the community considers that this is sufficiently important, then the author has to figure out a solution or explain things in such a way that this can be fixed. Now, if the community and the author don't manage to solve a problem that was uh, identified, well, this is a specific objection and consensus is not reached. So the consensus, lack of consensus is declared. So if you're registered in the mailing list and right there, you can start checking the option for new ideas. You can ask the community if they have any ideas as to how to find a solution to the objection. And of course, you can discuss any proposal that is being discussed precisely. And if you are registered in the mailing list, you can learn about new proposals that are being presented and also learn about the results of the consensus and ratification. So you will receive an email from the moderators informing you that consensus was not reached. In that case, the authors are asked, offered to either withdraw their proposal because this was rejected by the community or the author can decide to submit a new version for that proposal. So you will see that there are policy proposals that have reached version number six or version number eight even. This means that the community six or seven times said that they did not agree with the proposal. They do not agree in including it in the policy manual. So what authors normally do, well, you will note that authors tend to be insistent. So if an author works on a proposal, they really uh, dedicate themselves to do so. So they try and make the proposal go through changes in order to be adjusted to the comments made by the community and so that consensus can be reached. So those are the two things that can happen when a proposal does not reach consensus. Either you can withdraw your proposal, the idea could not progress. It might also happen that someone picks up the proposal at a later stage or maybe the author rewrites this proposal, removes what was considered an objection and present a new version of that same proposal. And it can also happen, and this is not the majority of the cases, of course, we said, well, this proposal is good, but it needs to be discussed further. So 
presenting a new version is optional. If the author wishes to do so, they can submit a new version or it can continue the way it was. What normally happens is that a new version is prepared or it is entirely withdrawn. So if consensus is not reached, to summarize, the author can reformulate it with a new version or withdraw it. So if it is rewritten, it is the same proposal, but a new version. But the community should be aware that when this happens, when the author wishes to relaunch the proposal with a new version, the process for that proposal starts from the very beginning again. It has to go through the initial discussion stage, then through all these stages that we were referring to earlier on. We wanted to highlight that the initial discussion consists of two parts, the discussion in the list and the discussion in the public policy forum. It has to go through these two stages. Both are valid. And like Ariel was saying, what is taken into account for the consensus is what happens in those two places, in the forum and in the discussion list. And we should also bear in mind that the list is open throughout the entire year. Let us not let it ignore it. We have to really express our questions, our doubts there. We have to ask for clarification there. So before providing support to a proposal, this is quite a healthy practice, mainly to use the discussion list. And the list also gives, a, gives you an amazing opportunity of the text lookup. If, and then this is recorded of the entire forum, but it's far more complicated to look for a comment. If you have a video, it's far easier to find comments in the discussion list, the policy, the dis discussion list is in the website and you can read every single email that was sent month by month or topic by topic and basically what you have there you can use your search tool in your own browser to find all the details or comments that you're interested in and you don't need to watch the entire video of the forum so if we wish to be practical the forum is necessary because it's part of the process requested by the community but the forum should be just for final stages final comments and not to discuss 100 percent of the proposal at the forum or 90 percent of the proposal at the forum and only 10 percent in the list so the idea is that most of discussion should take place in the list there are two forums a year so you have months and months to discuss this in the list and then at the face-to-face -face meeting, you can just look at the final details. And this is quite interesting. So that afterwards, the things that you don't understand in the mail, because sometimes uh, it's more difficult to, to notice the details, but then those details can be seen in person at the forum. And now, if I propose something and I go to the forum because I can travel, let's forget about the pandemic and let's assume that there is an, an in-person um, uh, event, do I need to go there in person? No. Ariel, there's no need for you to travel for, to be part of the public policy forum, although people may be in person at some uh, event of LACNIC anywhere in the region, but you can participate too of a public policy forum through uh, um, online, through the channels where you see the discussion through streaming, you see the discussion and you can give your feedback and there will be people of the staff that are going to 
um, take that to read your proposal and take it to the microphone. So there are no barriers whatsoever. You can participate. There is no, there are no physical barriers to as to where you are. So next year, let's assume that we won't have a pandemic and there will be uh, the, an event of Lacanic in the Vatican. So I can put this fake background and I can present a proposal. Yes, sure. You just need to be ready to present it as all the proposal. Good, good question. So let's see the impact assessment the, or the analysis. It's what helps the, um, um, it gives the, uh, uh, LACNIC analyzes the proposal and the changes that would ensue. So, Um, uh, there are several things, the technical things, reciprocity, the changes, it analyzes to what extent the proposal is consistent with uh, LACNIC's functions, because sometimes there are interpretations of the text that are not clear, that are rather vague. And so LACNIC may request uh, the text to be clarified precisely before for giving the feedback more clearly. So all these issues that are included in the impact analysis, many of them are not exclusive of LACNIC. These are issues that are also debated and elsewhere. The technical uh, issues or the, the um, by technical Technical issues, I, I mean the, the scope of a proposal that is discussed in the list. So it's important to hear the community's vision. Then there are issues that are intrinsic of LACNIC. For instance, what would be the impact of this proposal in LACNIC systems or in LACNIC solutions? But then all the rest, it's the vision of LACNIC in that regard, but these are things that the community gives their view of. So the impact analysis is an additional resource that is offered to, for, for discussion of the proposals that is published in the same text of the proposal in the policy uh, system. And sometimes it takes a while to be published because it needs to gather a number of elements. And the, it's, uh, so it's an active analysis that is done. And sometimes you need to ask external uh, organizations such as other RIRs or uh, the next, or and also because there are many areas at LACNIC that may have to analyze the impact and coordinating all that is complex. So it's you don't have the impact analysis right away. It's, it, it's, it's quite cumbersome, but anyway, it's a resource that is provided to enrich the discussion. So that's the idea. That's the truth. Well, I can give you an example of something, a concrete issue. I think that two years ago, we had been debating whether resources could be transferred from LACNIC to other regions outside. The community, there was an author that presented the proposal that in the past had been banned. So there was an author that says, I want to give a proposal so that if I have an IPv4 block, for instance, in the LACNIC region and uh, LACNIC gave it to me, I should be able to transfer it to my organization in another region. That is, in a nutshell, the inter-regional transfer. So uh, up to then, that was not possible. And the author said, no, this should exist because there are issues that if that doesn't exist, then the transfers from other regions to LACNIC won't work. So you just 
first mentioned reciprocity. What is reciprocity? Well, the same processes of policy development are very similar exist in the rest of the region. So there was a case where they determined from another region, you can transfer addresses to LACNIC, for instance, only if that policy is reciprocal. That is, if LACNIC allows transferring uh, resources to that other region, then we will uh, respond mutually. But as that didn't exist in LACNIC, then it was impossible to have reciprocity, so you couldn't transfer any blocks from that region to LACNIC. So that's the sort of thing that is shown in the impact analysis. That was one thing. Another issue was, say, well, if I have to allow the LACNIC members to be able to transfer resources to other regions, I need to have a system to do that. So you just showed, they just showed that the resource administration system had to be readapted to enable that uh, so, to enable transfers, for instance, to other regions. So in the impact analysis, then LACNIC uh, discusses the complexities and uh, the potential, let's say, the compatibility, how consistent the proposals would be if approved both with LACNIC systems and the, uh, the systems of the organizations of the other regions. And so it's very important to consider all this because sometimes we all agree, but we're, we all agree here in our, our region, but maybe that proposal uh, could complicate other things for LACNIC and other regions, for instance. Well, very often the authors especially with technical issues. They, have, they may have many ideas in their minds, but then afterwards they don't end up putting that in the text. So the, they may be ambiguous or vague and precisely the rest of the people debating that maybe know those things. And as they know it, they understand that they are implicit, but the impact analysis says, well, no, the author requests this or that, and this involves this or that. So it, uh, they, the, the text comes back much more complex. So both the author and the community get to know what would be the consequences for those proposals to be approved, if there are any. When there are no problems, then that's okay. Thank you, Ariel. Exactly. These are complex analysis. They are not ready right away, but they help. The purpose is to help in the discussion, precisely. Now, what happens with the authors? The authors can present proposals any time of the year, but it's important to have something in mind. If we are thinking that our proposal needs to be presented at the next forum, that proposal needs to be debated at least 14 days before the public policy forum. Am I right? Yes, yes. The example that I gave you at the beginning was precisely that. I said, well, I present, for instance, a proposal in December, December the 1st, and the forum will be on May the 10th. So I have to wait at least uh, eight weeks. Well, from uh, December the 1st to May the 10th, I, I have the time. But what happens if it's the other way around? If I uh, give a proposal for one month before the forum, what happens? Is it presented in the forum? Yes, yes. But the proposal needs to have at least eight weeks of discussion in the list, plus a forum. So what may happen is that I may uh, put the proposal, as this slide says, at least 14 days before the forum. The forum is, uh, uh, it has to be the, the date of the first part of the forum. For instance, now we have it uh, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday and Friday. So we consider Tuesday. So if I send the facts at least 14 days in advance of Tuesday, this proposal enters the forum, it's debated in the forum, and then when the forum is finished, then 
eight weeks have to go by and only then will a consensus be reached. So here, it doesn't matter if first it was presented to the forum or, or the eight weeks uh, uh, pass, the two things have to be met. Yes, exactly. So I got the forum, now I need the eight weeks of discussion. Yes, and if you presented 14 days, less than 14 days within the, the date of the forum, you have to wait for the next forum. Good, excellent. And here we had, well, it's very common for the authors to present proposals in the last minute, new versions. So, very often the authors do that based on the comments that they saw in the list, but you need to consider that, that the versions that can be presented in the forum are those that have been uh, under discussion for over 14 days. Yes, the forum, preparing the forum is very complex. We have the staff of LACNIC, well, the, uh, they, they help us, they support the, uh, the moderators a lot. Please consider that preparing the forum is very tedious. You need to see the agenda, the order of the presentations. You need to define the timeline very well because usually there are too many proposals and you don't have time enough for the forum. And it's quite complex and cumbersome for planning. So it's not good if one day before the forum you receive a new proposal because that is very disruptive. Maybe somebody noticed in the last minute of a certain problem and uh, the center. Uh, uh, a proposal. That is why we put that 14 day limit. That was somebody's idea because they saw that we were overburdened because there were proposals coming in every day. So they felt pity for us and they presented that proposal. The community accepted it and says then we need to have at least 14 days. Okay, so what do I need to present my proposal? An email address, the email address alone is not uh, enough. You need to be subscribed to the mailing list. There you have the address. I need to have an idea. I take the policy manual or I already know more or less uh, the uh, something and uh, certain issue that propose an improvement, but I need to have the idea in my mind. Then I have to draft the text to the LAC, through LACNIC's policy forum. I may have help for that. I may discuss this in the list before to be more attuned and to know what the community thinks. have to be willing to participate in the forums whether virtually or face to face but I have to be ready to present it at the forum and we put this slide here because uh, public uh, policy forums take place during LACNIC events these take place in May and in October we have two forums every year last year there were a lot of proposals. This was the first virtual forum we had since May. So there we had an intermediate stage in the month of August where we discussed policies that could not be included in the month of May. But this was an exceptional situation. We normally use the, do the public policy forums during the May event or in the October event. The policy development process of LACNIC is open to every registry. You can register, you can access the, the mailing list here on the screen. You don't need to be a LACNIC member, you don't need to be uh, someone from the region to be able to participate. Let me explain two things. Let me tell you about two anecdotes. I always give you the same example and Ricardo is going to kill me. But one day I was at an event at the face-to-face -face meeting and I saw that they were discussing 
Ricardo, I'm sorry I always uh, refer to you as an example. And they were discussing the fact that dial up should not be included in the policy manual. It had to be changed for something else. And there was this heated discussion taking place about that word. A word had to be changed. Uh, word that was pointless at a given stage and this was an amazing discussion a beautiful discussion i said well are they discussing this yes very often that kind of thing is discussed and here there is another reference half in jest of another proposal that goes to the other extreme someone suggested that another rir should be set up because we have Lachnik, Ripe, Afrinik, Apinik, and Arin, and that's why we had the rocket and the picture. Someone said, sometime we're going to colonize other planets, we're going to live in space. So it is a regional RIR for Latin America, for Africa. Why shouldn't we create a RIR for when we live in space? So once again, this is so that you can see the diversity of the proposals that have made either changing a word or creating a new RIR, which basically occupies a regional area that doesn't, uh, isn't still uh, feasible. So the ideas are totally that you can present are totally open. There are no limitations. Some policies are of a global nature. Some policies can be applied globally because these are then accepted by all the regions simultaneously. So this is totally open. You don't need to be a genius. We all realize at a given stage that something could be improved. So whatever the idea, either an enormous change or just a small word, it's important that you suggest this and it become part of the process. I'd like to add something beyond the joke or beyond uh, how funny this might be or sound. What is quite clear is that any proposal is valid and to have an ownership of that process of becoming part of the process is what really provides a guarantee to the fact that what is implemented is what represents us. This is like when, this is like deciding from the grassroots of the community what is done further upwards. And we really have to use this opportunity. And this is a process that is open, it is transparent, it is on an equal terms and has to be based on the principles of the governance of the internet. And the best way that we have for respecting this process is having ownership and really participating here. Because if we don't have a participatory process, this is like a contradiction. So let us really have ownership of this process so that we can determine how the registry will operate with that number of resources that have been assigned to all of us in this region. So I will go on a bit. These are the proposals that will be discussed at LACNIC 35. After working with the moderators, we reach this proposal for the next forum. We're going to discuss nine proposals, the ones you have on the screen. And in addition to the ID, the name of the proposal, the version, for example, some are presented for the first time, then you some have version four, version seven, and we have the author. And in the last column, we see what is being proposed, whether this will be modify a manual or the policy development process itself. Some are minor changes, other are more radical changes, but these are things that have to be used for, they have to be discussed at the public policy forum at LACNIC 35, we'll be discussing this. 
and they are the ones who will be there next week when Ariel and Thomas get together, they make all these discussions most entertaining. To finish and to go over to the Q&A session, I'd like to invite all of you to participate at the Public Policy Forum at LACNIC 35. Would you like to add anything, Ariel? Yes, let me highlight what you mentioned. Basically, we will have people here who will be proposing things. Sometimes these might affect you at a given stage, or some people might agree on uh, advancing with some of these points, and somehow this might not be so beneficial for you. So it's very important to pay attention to these things and to participate in the process. Because like, if you don't, if you don't have ownership over the process, others will be making decisions for you. And because this is an open forum, because it's so easy to participate, you just have to have an email. You don't need to pay anything at all. You, this has been designed in such a way so that everyone can participate. So that is it. That is all. And pay attention because proposals come up and might affect you. So it's very important for you to participate and let us know if you agree. And if you disagree, please let us know why. So let's go over to the Q&A session. I will stop sharing my screen. Let's see if there are any questions. I see nobody has asked any questions. So if there are no questions. Maybe they're typing, just give them some time. Well, I was going to say something in the meantime. Either you got totally bored or we're totally clear. I don't know. Or no one has any questions. Or maybe you cannot write all the questions you might have. Well, we hope that this has been useful to you. We would have loved Thomas to be here with us today. But before giving the floor to Sandra to wrap up, let me say that we look forward to meeting you at LACNIC, 13, uh, LACNIC 35 on Tuesday the 11th. You will be able to use a microphone to state your opinion you, in addition to writing the questions. So we look forward to meeting you next Tuesday the 11th at the Public Policy Forum. Thank you, Sandra. You have the floor now. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you, everyone, for participating in this excellent activity. I invite you to visit the webinars website of LACNIC and also the social media and other activities that we organize at the training center. As Mariela was saying, we invite you to our online meeting, LACNIC 35. For those of you who haven't registered yet, thank you very much once again, and we look forward to meeting you at the next webinar. Goodbye.